Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand and affirm the promise that is related to the door of our hope. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again privilege to be at this holy place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. Allow your inheritance in the name of the covenant of blood to be lifted to heights higher than us and to break the chains of all evil and sin that holds us captive. May in this service be cursed all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, ignorance, covetousness, all of this, let it depart from the tents of your holy people and stand, O Lord, on the place of your rest, you in the ark of your greatness. And may your saints be clothed in your redemption and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit. Fill us with your Spirit. Allow us to discover your shining countenance. I lay the service in your divine arms. Guide it with your uplifted hand. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord bless you. You may be seated. Молодые дубровы, по 
По весне светлый дождик стучит за листву. Я живу на земле нежным солнцем согрета. Здесь в зеленых лугах сладко пахнут цветы. Громыхаю тревожными грозами лета. Птицы радостно песни поют с высоты. Я живу на земле, по которой как странно трудный путь свой прошел. Иисус на заре, царь царей Божий сын, чудный Божий избранник, Он нам дал жизнь на земле за спасение людей. Я живу на земле, по которой как стране трудный путь свой прошел. Иисус Назарей, Царь Царей Божий Сын, Чудный Божий избранник, Он дал жизнь на кресте за спасение людей. Я живу на земле, как прохожие страны, Подражая святым, верить тем, кто прошли. Направляясь туда, в город чудный и славный, По едином пути, куда Бог указал. Я живу на земле, здесь суровые зимы, Здесь дана благодать, чтобы все побеждать. Здесь со мною всегда неотступно и зримо. Мой Христос, без Него жизни в жизни не была. Я живу на земле, по которой, как странник, Трудный путь свой прошел. Иисус Назарей, царь царей Божий сын, Чудный Божий избранник, Он дал жизнь на кресте за спасение людей. Я живу на земле, по которой, как стране, Трудный путь свой прошел, Иисус на заре, Царь царей Божий Сын, Чудный Божий избранник, Он дал жизнь на кресте за спасение людей. Он дал жизнь на кресте за спасение людей. Редактор субтитров А.Семкин Корректор А.Егорова 
Учиться на сияние, Нам увидим любимых и близких людей. Свет оно не проникнет, И лицо не поникнет, Только радость и счастье Нам вечно царит. Before we continue to submerge into the depths of our inheritance in Christ Jesus, the unchanging epigraph of our study of the Word of God is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And so for us, as partakers of the body of Christ, to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about him in Scripture, we shall continue our study of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit and the truth of Scripture and what is necessary to be done from our side so that we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life and put on the new form of life. The book of Ephesians 4:22 through 24. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. To fulfill this command, as we already know, we need to utilize three charging and fundamental verbs, and these are to be to put off, be renewed, and put on. We've noted that your decision regarding these three destiny-affecting actions to put off, be renewed, and finally put on will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath, or more specifically, will the occurrence of our salvation happen that is given to us in the format of a guarantee 
guarantee, or will we lose it and our name, names be forever blotted out of the Book of Life, although they may have been written there at one time? In a specific format, we have already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the following question. What conditions do we need to fulfill so that by the means of an already renewed mind we begin the process of dressing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth? And when we speak of clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that contains the power of the resurrection of Christ in the all armor of light, we've concluded that we need God's help in the form of his redeeming mercy. And the means of receiving any kind of help in the form of the inheritance of the mercies of God is the weaponry of prayer or worship in spirit and in truth, since prayer isn't just a man's means of communicating with God, but also a kind of legal and sacral right that a man gives heaven, a tool that activates the given law of God. Man gives heaven the right so that heaven may intervene upon the territory of earth. Considering that the most powerful form of prayer is a continual prayer that does not back away from its goal until what is asked for is received, we together have been studying the format of continual prayer in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest, being a continual remembrance or a memorial before God. The power of such a prayer is called to demonstrate the unlimited authority of God over our genesis and the allotted by him for us time and boundaries. Due to this, we came to the necessity to study the goal God pursues in his intentions when he urges and calls his children to become warriors in prayer, and also in what way and upon what conditions God is able and desires to give man the right to become a warrior in prayer, so that man is able to present the interests of God in the implementation of his inheritance in God. According to the revelations of Scripture, as much as we know our prayer as a warrior in prayer is identified in the virtue of twelve precious stones of the breastplate of the, of judgment of the high priest, and it needs to be, first of all, continual, persistent, third, diligent, fourth, with boldness, fifth, with reverence, sixth, with the faith of your heart, with thanksgiving, with joy, in the fear of the Lord, and finally, in the Holy Spirit. In the previous services, we, in a specific format, have already looked at the essence of the first eight components that identify the state of the heart of a warrior in prayer, as well as the quality of his prayer, and stop to study the ninth component, quality of continual prayer. This is the presence of the fear of the Lord in prayer, or prayer that is made in the fear of the Lord. But first, I would like to once again present the antonyms or opposite qualities of prayer that have already been a part of our studies, because understanding the context or background of any any of these qualities or every one of these qualities will better help us understand the quality and character of true prayer. The antonym of continual is unfaithful or not continuing. The antonym of persistent is resisting. The antonym of diligent is lazy. The antonym of boldness is audacity. The antonym of reverence is forsaking and hatred. The antonym of the faith of God is unbelief and resisting of the faith of God. The antonym of thanksgiving is unthankful, hard-hearted, or stiff-necked. The antonym of joy is sorrow and brokenness. That dries the bones. And the antonym of the fear of the Lord is the fear of man. As in the previous qualities of prayer... It is necessary for us to look at four classical questions, and these are first, from what wellspring does the fear of the Lord flow, and what qualities or criteria does the fear of the Lord have? Second, what purpose is the fear of the Lord supposed to fulfill within our relationship with God, with each other, and with all of the world? Third, what price or what conditions do we need to fulfill so that we can be filled with the fear of the Lord in prayer? Or how do we keep or increase the fear of the Lord within our heart? Fourth, by what results do we need to examine ourselves on the presence of the fear of the Lord within our heart? In the previous services, we in a specific format already studied the essence of the first two questions and stopped to study the third question. In short formulations, I want to remember the essence of the fear of the Lord contrary to the fear of man. We've noted that the fear of the Lord and the fear of man are two absolutely different programs that come from two diametrically opposite wellsprings, identifying the program of eternal life that comes from God, containing, containing the quality and the nature of God, and the program of eternal death that comes from the entrails of the fallen cherubim, 
containing his quality and his nature. We know that the first Adam, due to disobedience to God, was transformed into the programmable system of the fallen angel and inherited from him a program opposite of God's fear, which has been passed down to all mankind and came to be called the fear of man. The character included in the fear of the Lord, as with the previous qualities, is prescribed in Scripture for creating prayer as a commandment, as a requirement, a direct order that can't be ignored. As a military command, if it is unfulfilled, the verdict is death or a final break of your peaceful relationship with God. The fear of the Lord as a program identifying the life of God is identified as the spring of the wisdom of God and as a carrier and demonstrator of this wisdom. And as a program, it is able to exist and demonstrate itself in nothing else but a programmable system, identifying the wisdom of the heart, which is the heart of a born-from-God man, that becomes a possessor of a faithful mind, abiding in the commandments of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. Psalm 110. 10. We've noted that the reason for many misconceptions and wrongs is what our mind is dependent upon or from. If we place our mind in dependence of men, we will be pleasing because of our weakness, their ignorance, and their religious ambitions. If we place our mind in dependence of the traditions of man, then for the sake of those traditions, we will remove or move the commandments of God aside. If we place our mind in dependence of logical form of thinking or obtained experience, then we also will be far from the fear of the Lord. Although the fear of the Lord as the wisdom of God isn't against logical or rational thinking, because of its eternal being or existence and exalted nature in the fourth dimension, it does not depend on logical form, the logical form of thinking, and governs logic. Therefore, only when we, contrary to many human authorities, place our mind in dependence from the revelations of Scripture, that is when we will be able to be filled with the fear of the Lord demonstrated in His divine and exceeding wisdom. We know well that the world we live in has many forms of existing fear and even more phobias. And practically, the entire world is underpinned by fear and phobias. But all of these forms of fear come from one wellspring, the fallen cherubim. These fears were inherited from the first Adam when he sinned and were passed on genetically to all mankind. And further, all of these forms of fear do not parallel or identify with the unique and great, and the great nature of fear that comes from God and is passed down by right of birth from God to man. We need to keep in mind that any form of fear that does not come from God yields suffering. At the same time, the fear of the Lord prompts a trembling reverence before God and an unexplainable admiration as it place, places a man in the safest place called God. As it is written, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. And so God's perfect and selective love of God, it drives away fear, because there is torment in fear, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love, 1 John 4, 18. Therefore, therefore, if our worship is done out of the fear of the Lord, contained within the twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment, then it cannot be accepted by God. And that is specifically why any attempt to enter the presence of God, to call upon God or to serve God, without the presence of the fear of the Lord, deeply offends God, does not consider God, and actually resists God. The absence of the fear of the Lord within the heart of a man testifies about the fact that this person is bound by the fear of man or human fear. And so such people, although they have received salvation, will be marching and will be first marching into hell and will lead all the rest of the ignorant, all the fornicators, abominable murderers, and so, and so forth as it is written. But the cowardly unbelieving and the, so the first are the cowardly, 
And so in the parade that will be marching to hell, cowardly will be first. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Revelation 21, 8. The word fear, wisdom, and commandment when it comes to the nature of God are identical as they identify the moral virtues of God. And because they are identical, the one word describes the other as they come one from the other and authenticate one the other. This is specifically why the fear of the Lord is the true wisdom of God presented in the commandments of the Lord. At the same time, true wisdom in the commandments of the Lord is identified as the fear of the Lord, identifying the given law of God. And so, third question, what conditions do we need to fulfill so that we can be filled with the fear of the Lord in prayer and abide within the fear of the Lord? In a specific format, we've studied four conditions that are necessary in order to abide and be filled with the fear of the Lord and stop to study the fifth condition. I will remind us that the boundary of the fear of the Lord as a program of God is the boundary of the heart of a person that fears God, as the heart is a programmable system for the fear of the Lord. The first condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is the necessity to clothe yourself into the mantle of a student of Christ, raising or elevating this person into the status of a servant of the Lord. Psalm 34:11. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The second condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is having a pure heart, cleansed from dead works. Hebrews 9, 13, 14, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, here it's talking about the body. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 9, 13, 14. The third condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart consists in honoring the Word of God and treating the Word of God presented in the name of God and the given law of God as, as God honors and treats His own Word. Psalm 138.2, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your Word above all your name. The fourth condition for receiving abiding for receiving abiding and being filled with the fear of the Lord in your heart, it is necessary to be a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch that grows out of its roots. Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. And now, the fifth condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is the requirement to be an organic member of Zion, which is what we had been studying and will study in more depth, as it is linked to Zion, to the body of a person and the body of Christ. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Isaiah 33, 5, 6. According to the above-read prophecy, we can see that the stability of our times, the strength of salvation and wisdom and knowledge, are identified as the treasure of the fear of the Lord. These stable times can come only after God fills Zion with justice and righteousness. But first, so that the fear of the Lord become our treasure, it is necessary for us to become members of Zion or become sons and daughters of Zion. And to become sons and daughters of Zion, it is necessary to know the characteristics that Zion possesses and what conditions we need to fulfill to become an organic member of Zion. Because everything that the scriptures present in its godly programs, Satan always presents a counterfeit form. There's a false Zion that exists as well, and so it's very important what Zion you are a part of. Considering, therefore, that the relationship of God with his redeemed person and salvation of the redeemed person are placed in direct dependence from his organic member to Zion.
Practically, the destiny of every individual nation and all nations as a whole are placed in direct dependence of their relationship to Zion, as well as Zion's relationship to these nations. It is not important how a kingdom is, how much weapons they have, what kind of doctrine they believe, what part party they belong to, Democrats, Communists, Fascists, it makes no difference. It is important how they treat Zion. And if they treat Zion correctly, then they will be blessed. But if they treat Zion badly, unfaithfully, they offend it, then it will be bad for them. In Scripture, there are more than 150 direct places in which the definition of Zion are presented, the purpose of Zion, and the conditions giving us the right to the power to be an organic member of Zion. I will remind us that in Hebrew, Zion, this is not a complete list of the definition. Zion means famous, lifted by God, exalted by God, the mountain of God, immovable foundation, the strength of righteousness, immovable stronghold, a high mountain upon which God dwells, the city of David, beautiful elevations, the joy of all the earth, the fear of all the earth, the healing of all the earth, the justice of God, the house of God, the city of God, the place of God's rest, the joy of God, the gladness or celebration of God. Therefore, so that the fear of the Lord become our treasure, we, according to what we just heard, definitely not the full list of definitions and purposes of Zion, have decided to study the definitions to identify our organic membership to the purpose of Zion and the conditions that give us the right and power to be this organic member. And so the first place of scripture and the first element included by which we need to conclude that we that the fear of the Lord is our treasure is when in our life, as in the life of the nation of Israel, the Zion will become our stronghold, center, and focus of faith. In their life, in the nation of Israel, as in our life, then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also, in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler ruler over over Israel. And so the symbol of these two kings, the first king is the mind of man, the second is the mind of Christ, the renewed mind of man. Therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king of Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. You remember Christ was 30 years old when he began his service. And he reigned 40 years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. In Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites in the inhabited of the land who spoke to David, saying, shall not, You shall not come. Now David said on that day, and he established the stronghold called the city of David. And David built all around from the millow and inward. So David went on and became great in the Lord's sight. The second element contained in the purpose of Zion, in the Zion of our body, so that the fear of the Lord become our treasure, is the building of our body by God into the image of the building of the heavens and establishing our body as the earth was established forever. Then the Lord awoke as from sleep, like a mighty man who shouts because of wine, and he beat back his enemies and put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribes of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved, and he built a sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he has established forever. He also chose David a servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes that had young, he, that the ones that he had brought forth to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. Psalm 78, 65 through 71. The third element in the essence of the Zion of our body, so that the fear of the Lord become our treasure, is to test whether the Zion of our body is the joy of the whole earth, a marvel and fear for the gathering against us kings. 
Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth, in Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is in her pla- in her palaces. He is known as her refuge, for behold, the kings assembled, they passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled, they were troubled, they hastened away. Fear took hold of them there, and pain as of woman in birth pains, as when he breaks the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. Psalm 48, 2-7. I won't go into the details, as we had all already studied this in the previous services. The fourth element in the essence of Zion, of our body, by which we need to determine the condition giving us the right for the fear of the Lord to be our treasure, is to hate evil, rejoice in the Lord, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holy name. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship Him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad. And the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, Lord, are most high above the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Psalm 97, 7-12. And so for the fear of the Lord to be our treasure, it is necessary for the Zion of our body to satisfy the required characteristics presented in the given allegory. First, so that we rejoice and are glad when God, by the means of our spirit, will shame all of the betrayers who serve their carved images and boast about their idols. Second, so that we, as those who love our Lord, would hate evil in the form of the unclean, who devise evil against us, which will provide God grounds to deliver us from the hand of the unclean. Third, so that we, as partakers of the righteousness of Zion, would rejoice about the Lord and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. This is the consistency of this prophecy that we read, that we need to be in accordance to, we need to find ourselves in as a part of that Zion. Therefore, so that we, with the power that God has given us, shame all those who serve their carved images and boast about their idols, we need, we need two things. And that is, first, to differentiate those serving their carved images from those who serve the Lord and differentiate idols from the true God. Which is why it is necessary for us to answer two questions. Who are the wicked in the midst of our gathering? What are idols and carved images that they consider their gods? And all of this is happening in the midst of the Church of the Saints, the Church of God. These are not some other separate places. This is all in one place. And how do you differentiate one from the other? Wicked are people that do not accept and resist the order implemented by God in the body of Christ, called to build all and each individual person into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, sin, turning a holy person into a wicked person, consists in him not accepting the power and authority of the person that God has placed and attempts to take his place, disputing his decisions, because they are jealous of him and hate him. This is why they spread bad rumors about him and ascribe their wickedness to him. As it is, this category of people are only that category of scribes and Pharisees who place themselves as inspectors of the truth and helpers of pastors who are, ele- who are elected by, by them but, and are given power and authority. Idols and carved images that the wicked serve, this is a foreign gospel, where the fruit of the Spirit is replaced with service to God in such aspects as their own personal evangelism, rebuking of demons, practicing supernatural demonstrations, and materialistic success. Therefore, to examine yourself as to whether you are included in the category of the sons and daughters of Zion, it is necessary to examine yourself on whether we are ready to pour out the verdict of the just judgment of God upon the unclean and the lawless who support them. Considering, therefore, that these can, it could be that our close relatives and friends may end up in this category. And are we ready to rejoice and be glad when we hear that the judgments of God have shamed people worshipping their carved images and their idols? The next aspect, in order to test yourself as to whether you are a member of the sons 
and daughters of Zion, it is necessary for us to love our Lord, hate evil, in the form of the unclean and wicked who persecute us, which will provide God grounds to deliver us from the hand of the unclean. Because it is not possible to hate evil as a program, it only functions within a programmable system. There's a carrier of this evil. Therefore, it is necessary for us to answer two other questions. By what criteria is evil identified, the carriers of which are people devising evil against us? And in what way are we to hate evil and the carriers of evil and love good in the carriers of good? In reference to this, we need to remember that evil as well as good are actually battling between each other programs that come from two different contrary to each other wellsprings. Evil are any thoughts, words, actions, behavior, or goals that don't come from God. Considering this, it does not matter whether they whether they are uh, kind words, actions, or goals, or if they appear humble. If their author is not God, this is identified as evil. The carriers of such concealed nature of evil are people who received salvation but did not cleanse their conscience from dead works. Good are any thoughts, words, actions, behavior, and goals that are done being inspired by the Holy Spirit. And carriers of such an unearthly program of good are the saints who have cleansed their conscience from dead works. Further, we've noted that noted and established more than once that love and hatred are not identified as our feelings, but as the act of obedience to the, to the commandments of the Lord or the act of resisting the commandments of the Lord leading our feelings. Therefore, to love God and your neighbor is to treat God and your neighbor in accordance to the demands of the commandments, not emotions, the commandments. You need to lead your emotions. And so again, to love God and your neighbor is to treat God and your neighbor in accordance to the demands of the commandments. John 14, 15 through 18, if you love me, keep my commandments. You see, love is demonstrated in your fulfilling God's commandments. It doesn't matter what I feel. I can feel bad. My body can refuse to fulfill the commandments of the Lord. I may feel uncomfortable when I fulfill the commandments of the Lord, but by fulfilling it, I demonstrate my love to God. This is the actions that you take. So don't uh, worry if you're doing one thing and feeling something different in, within. Base, base everything from the fact that you're fulfilling God's command, not what you feel, but what you're doing. Why your feelings are behaving this way, that's because your horse is not yet disciplined. But as you're doing this against the will of your horse, the horse will eventually submit to the will of its master and follow him. So if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. John 14, 15 through 18. It is the same with hating evil in the form of carriers of this evil, is to treat the carriers of evil according to the demands of the commandments of the Lord. Again, these are not emotions of hatred inside, these are actions where you're told do not communicate, do not be with these people, do not go anywhere with such people and you do the, and you do and, bo and behave and obey. Second Corinthians 6 11 through 18. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you, our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Nothing needs to be... Uh, common between the two of you and what communion has light with darkness and what accord has Christ with Belial or what part has a believer with an unbeliever they're not holy they're unbelievers they're unfaithful and so why do you find common things with such people and what agreement has the temple of God with idols for you are the temple of the living God if their God is actually evangelism and they worship other things rather than God
As God has said, I dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians 6, 11 through 18. The third condition for the fear of the Lord to become our treasure, it is the necessity for the Zion of our body to satisfy the required characteristics presented in the above-read allegory in Psalm 97. Give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. To in joy, give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. We need to identify what the remembrance of God is in its essence and its definition. And also, who or what is the holiness of the Lord, or what nature of memory is the holiness of the Lord? We know that the remembrance is a gathering of thoughts or a treasury of image information and impressions that are, that are received by us from the physical world, from the aspect of the spiritual world, and from the aspect of the genetic line received by us from the physical seed, the sinful life of our fathers. In other words, speaking, memory is an information of the past that has been imprinted in our heart and is kept in our subconscious in the form of images. First, these are words and actions that are spoken and done by us in the past. Second, these are words and actions of other people that took part in our form in our formation and that witnesses of which we are. These are incidences in the political, economical world or aspects that we may have experienced. These are cataclysms maybe that we may have experienced or that we received information from, from our past life. Fifth, this is knowledge about God and his deeds that are received by us, either by looking at the works of God and his creation of the universe or by studying the Holy Spirit and Holy Scriptures and believing them or by being taught or being instructed in the faith or the revelation of the Holy Spirit. In accordance to Scripture, such memory within a man identifies the essence of this person and his sovereign boundaries. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he, Proverbs 23, 7. It is the same with the memory of God that contains the thoughts, goals, and following those, his words and actions that are done in the past, in the present, and the future. They identify the very essence of God as well as his sovereign boundaries. Our memory is the mem memory of the past. In, in God, it is the past, present, and future. Because unlike man, God, due to his power over time and due to his omnipotence and exaltation over time, he simultaneously is present in the past, present, and future, and he also holds the past, present, and the future. As it is written, in the beginning was the word, logos, a thought, in the original, and the word logos thought was with God, and the word logos, which is a thought, was God. He logos thought was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, here in Greek already, it's rhema, spoken word. And without him, rhema, spoken word, nothing was made that was made. <coughs> In him, Rhema, the spoken word, was life, and the life, Rhema, spoken word, was the light of men. And the light, Rhema, the spoken word, shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. <clears throat> John 1, 1 through 5. And now I will present a more elaborated version of the same place of scripture. In the beginning, there was an informational program in the format of a thought, and this informational program in the format of a thought abided in the entrails of the Father and identified the essence of the Father. It was in the beginning in God. At that, all that was made was made by the word that came out of the mouth of God, and without his thought, voiced in word, nothing was made that was made, and the word that came out of his mouth of God was life, and this life was in his spoken word. And it was the light for man. And the light of this word shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not able to take this word because this word devours all darkness. And so the memory of God is the informational program of God, identifying the natural essence of God and his good and unchanging goals revealed by him in his works that are imprinted and abiding in the programmable system of God, which is the good heart of a person that is born from the imperishable seed of the word of God that abides forever.
And so the holiness, the holiness of God is the work of God and the personal things of God that are within his power and boundaries of his redemption, by which we can judge about the natural perfection of God and his good goals. The memory of the holiness or remembrance of his holiness speaks of the fact that the good works of God that the works of God as God are eternal. The memory of God as an informational program of redemption are revealed in the chosen by God flock or demonstrated in his chosen flock are in the likeness of the scriptures as a living book. Revelations 5, 1 through 5, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals. So this scroll is this Zion that we're speaking about. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And as soon as the seals began to come off, the judgments of God started. Zion is the carrier of the judgments of God. In the following allegory, we see this scr scroll as Zion, which is a peace, peace, a peace for God forever. To reveal and read this book or the scroll in the form of Zion is to bring forth and fulfill the verdict of the judgments of God written upon the heart of Zion. The uniqueness of the book of the scroll, everything writ that's written within this scroll, which is the heart of Zion, is written in the memory of in the book of the memories of God as well. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord, yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is, is it that we have kept his ordinances and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed, for those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before them for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. <clears throat> and so this book of remembrance is the Zion. For those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Malachi 3.13-18 <clears throat> The remembrance of his holiness is information contained in the format of the thoughts of God that are kept upon the tablets of our heart and confessed in the works of God that were done in the days of old. The remembrance of his holiness within our heart transforms us into the image of our thinking, identifying the works of God within our heart that were done by him in the days of old. Therefore, the remembrance of his holiness within our heart is demonstrated in the right that we give God for the intervention of his mercy in our life. As it is written, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple, Jonah 2.7. When we have this remembrance of the holiness of the Lord, when we begin to uh, become weary or then it comes from within this memory and our prayer then goes up to him, then we can say, why are you doubting my soul? Why are you sad and I will still praise the Lord. We will remember that due to our abilities which the Lord has placed into us in the moment of our creation, we are unable to keep within our heart the memory of the works of God done by Him in the days of old while looking upon the works of man. Therefore, keeping the memory of the works of God within your heart that were done by Him in the days of old, if we do this, if we keep the memory of the works of God within our heart that were done by him in the days of old, then we blot out the memory of the works of man as well as the information that is passed down to us from the sinful life of our fathers. 
to keep within your heart the memory of the works of God done by him in the days of old in the format of our redemption from sin and death and so this is the work of redemption from sin and death it is a choice role and responsibility of man therefore blotting out or erasing the memory of the works of God within the heart by the means of focusing your eyes and your thoughts upon the works of man means depriving yourself from the right to eternal life and condemning yourself to death in the lake of fire no one can blot out the memory of the works of God except for ourselves. The memory of man containing the memory of God is the strength and armor of God, of man. And if you deprive him of such memory, this man, he will be as similar as a destroyed city. Psalm 9, 6, O enemy destructions are finished forever, and you have destroyed cities, even their memory has perished. The, rem the remembrance of the works of God within the heart of a man is the inheritance of Christ identified in the format of redemption and is passed down this inheritance from one righteous generation to the next. Psalm 102.12 But you, O Lord, shall endure forever and the remembrance of your name to all generations. The remembrance of the works of God imprinted upon the heart of a man is the holiness of God and the com component of his unfading glory. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of of his holy name, Psalm 34. According to the scriptures, all of the miracles and works of God done by him in the days of old can be memorable within our heart if they will be written upon the tablets of our heart as a revelation of who God is to us and what God has done for us and how God sees us. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, Psalm 111.4. We need to ask the question, what purpose is the inheritance, what purpose is the remembrance of the wonderful works of God being the holiness of God imprinted upon the tablets of our heart called to fulfill within the relationship of God and man? To remember the already known to us revelations to refresh our memory, I will bring forth four components in the purpose of the remembrance of the works of God contained in the memory of our heart, which is the holiness of God. The first element in the purpose of the remembrance of the works of God contained in the memory of our heart being the holiness of God is to be the remembrance of the covenant that God had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The second element in the purpose of the remembrance of the works of God contained in the memory of our heart being the holiness of God is the place of worship upon which God records his name. The third element in the purpose of the remembrance of the works of God contained in the memory of our heart which is the holiness of God, are the two precious onyx stones that are placed upon the shoulders of the ephod of the high priest. The fourth element in the purpose of the remembrance of the works of God contained in the memory of our heart, which is the holiness of God, is the breastplate of the high priest, which is a continual memorial before God. <clears throat> we will remember that by, that by having this item, we will be able to examine ourselves as to whether we are included in the sons and daughters of Zion, to therefore determine and examine ourselves as to whether the Lord is our treasure. And so the first element in the purpose of the remembrance of the works of God contained in the memory of our heart being the holiness of God is to be the remembrance of the covenant that God has made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants, they shall inherit it forever, Exodus 32, 13. We need to keep in mind that all the things that God has promised the redeemed by him man is within the legitimate field of the covenant, which he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whom he called Israel. And to enter into this inheritance of the memories of the works of God that are contained in the format of the legitimate field of his covenant that serves before God as an eternal memorial within these three names is possible by being born from the imperishable seed of the word of truth which is Christ within us by making with him and in him this covenant of blood, salt and peace. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Galatians 3.13-14 And so redemption from the Oath of the law, if you 
If we turn with our repentance where we die for our nation, our house, and our inherited genetical uh, considerations and dependences, repentance that has an absence of these things is not able to redeem us from the oath of the law because upon the tablets of our heart there will be an absence of being a part of the memory of these covenants, the, this covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And consequently, the absence of such uh, a covenant made with God, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, will not be able to give God the ability to pour upon us by Christ the blessings of Abraham because that was inherited to, that was passed down to Isaac and Jacob also, because we have not sincerely repented, therefore. Leviticus 26, 40-42 But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to, him, to me and that they also have walked contrary to me and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if their uncircumcision hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. I will remember, I will remember the land. God remembers his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they had upon their bodies the memory of the covenant, that is the circumcision of the foreskin. For them, it was a seal of righteousness that they had. And so this was not the seal of righteousness, this was evidence of the fact that they had the seal of righteousness before their circumcision. They died for their nation, their house, and their fleshly desires. And so first, their heart was circumcised before they were circumcised in in the flesh. And so these three men themselves were made in the covenant of salt, peace, salt, and peace. Uh, and blood. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people, to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the roads, and their pasture shall be on all desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them, for he who has mercy on them will lead them even by the springs of water he will guide them as in 49 8 through 10 we clearly see the ruling of christ the ruling of the resurrection of christ within our bodies or in zion considering that abraham was an example of the covenant of blood where a person by faith received justification freely so when god had decided to destroy the cities of sodom and gomorrah he remembered about abraham and brought forth lot from brought out lot from that destruction and it came to pass when god destroyed the cities of the plain that god remembered abraham and sent lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities to which in which lot had dwelt genesis 1929 if a person will not establish his righteousness in the covenant of salt and the covenant of peace that he received in the covenant of blood freely by grace then the uh, righteousness he received in the covenant of blood will stop being righteousness and he his name will be blotted out of the book of life just as Lot received just righteousness in the covenant of Abraham but his descendants the Am Ammonites and Moabites were placed out of the covenant that God made with Abraham as they had hired against Israel Balaam the son of Beor to curse them the Ammonites and the Moabites shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt, and became there, and because they hired against you Balaam the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you. Because the Lord your God loves you, you shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. Deuteronomy 23, 3-6. So if you pay attention, do not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. This was a command of God. It says that they were in the covenant, they were relatives, with, and they came out with Abraham. 
Here it's talking about the multitude that came to God but did not want to pay the proper price. They then will turn against us and already turned. In all generations, these, the multitudes would turn against the smaller flock that rejoiced at the remembrance of God's holy name. And they were some of the most evil of enemies. You know, when I was a small child, and many of you who grew up in the Soviet Union, this was a very atheist country. Communism wasn't a religion. It wasn't just a denial of God's existence. It was a worse a, a denial of God, and they called atheism. And I thought that the worst persecution that a, a church could experience was atheism the world, and only becoming older, or even being a, a young man, or still being a young man, I with pain began to realize that the greatest of enemies are the people in the church that begin to be jealous of you, that twist all of your intentions, that pour you with mud, and spread bad rumors about you people that you considered to be close to you, that you worried about, that you loved. And suddenly you find out that they pass all kinds of rumors about you. This was obviously a shock, especially when these people uh, uh, occupy very uh, considerable or respected positions in the church. And these weren't just regular members of the church, these were Episcopals and others that would speak, uh, tell me one thing in my uh, looking in my eyes would tell me one thing but speak very different things behind my back and so and so he, they would consider me and so these people that I knew they would spread all kinds of rumors about me and uh, sometimes uh, they, sometimes people uh, would uh, church other churches would offer me a position in their churches and I would still remain in uh, the church that I was in where I was being uh, spoken very badly about uh, and I had to uh, and God allowed this so that I would uh, overcome these things and I did not leave my place when I was very much convinced and I, uh, I thought about it and I thought, truly, I can move. And then God revealed to me in a dream. I saw a very surprising vision. I, I won't tell, talk about this vision right now, but in this vision uh, that the Lord showed me that the church where I was, it's my wife and she has betrayed me. But I can't leave her. I love her. And so God showed me love. The church is not guilty. It's all the past. It's the pastors or the leaders in that church. And until God uh, prom prompted the entire brotherly council of another church. Uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, arise and because they had excluded me from that church and they were they they heard about this and they came to question why this happened and they saw this was unjustly done and came to argue this with the with the church that I was a member of at the time and so they said he has a mustache he's not Russian. Uh, and bald is what they would say and so these people will will do these kinds of things to you and so when Israel is passing by or experiencing these things they hired Balaam so that he can curse the nation they will find ways to, to, to do things to the people of God 
If you remember, when we came here uh, uh, to the church uh, and started to gathering, uh, what did all the surrounding churches uh, that uh, rel these religious uh, sects of these churches uh, do as soon as we began to gather here? They fasted for three days that our church would destroy. And in one of the churches, and so the three days that they fasted and they would pray 24 hours a day while they were fasting. So one group would come, another would uh, would come, then leave, the other group would come and they would uh, trade off and uh, work uh, pray in shifts. And in one of the church they were pray churches they were praying and they hear something dancing and as if music on, on, their, on the on the on the roof of the house of the, of the church and they see they come out and see demons dancing on the top of the church and they are afraid and call their pastor of the church of their church they, there's demons dancing on the roof and the pastor said uh, that means we're doing something wrong stop praying so this was just in one of the churches this happened I just want to show that so we could see who is Lot. These are people of the flesh that did not want to come out of the position of, of, of spiritual infancy. They, want, they consider themselves spiritual because they have religious experience and they confronted Israel. But God said, I didn't want to hear Balaam because he knew how to correctly pray Balaam, but he pursued the wrong goals with the correct prayers. And God said, I didn't want to hear him, and I turned your uh, his curse to a blessing to you because the Lord loves you. And he says, you shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all of the days, your days forever. And so all these people that Hate, hate you and persecute you, do not seek their peace nor prosperity. God has commanded this, this is an oath, God has made an oath with these things and he will avenge and he will judge them. And what if these are your close relatives? Choose, either you will perish with your close relatives or you will save your souls. The choice is yours. Lot, who came out with Abraham, with and his and his and all of their families, they came out, and these are relatives of Abraham. This is a symbol of the people who received their justification by faith. But instead of establishing the received by them righteousness upon the tablets of their heart, they confronted the righteousness of God and chose it uh, and chose their deeds instead the deeds in the flesh instead of the works of God for example if I'm not dressing correctly that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be saved it's not written there of course yes it says that our clothing not prompt the desires of the opposite sex that we dress properly that it be acceptable before God that it be orderly but if someone due to their ignorance or due to the fact that they're bound by sin and are not listening that doesn't mean they need to be uh, disqualified or but in these churches they will disqualify you from the church but they will not disqualify you from passing on bad rumors for hate for pride inside they don't even look at this they're all uh, presented in a different light let us go on a little further the second element in the purpose of the remembrance of the works of God contained in the memory of our heart being the holiness of God is the place of worship upon which God records his name an altar of earth you shall make for me and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings your sheep and your oxen in every place where I record my name I will come to you and I will bless you Exodus 20 24 it's only upon the place where the Lord has recorded his name is where uh, where he desires to uh, for us to build his altar it's talking about Zion 
where the Lord has recorded his name. It's not in every church where the Lord's name is recorded because many churches are either clubs or mausoleums. Rarely will you find a true church today. And so, based on the given places of scripture, not every heart of a saved person can be a place of worship upon which God would be able to record his name. These will be churches and they will be separate people that are a part of Zion. Because not every heart saved, uh, of a saved person is established in the truth of the preached word about the kingdom of heaven. If a person is not established in the truth and it does not know what the kingdom of heaven is, then his heart cannot be the place of worship. And not every heart can receive the seed of the kingdom of heaven, that is a preached word about the kingdom of heaven, and grow the seed into the tree of life that bears twelve fruit times every month its own fruit. And so not every saved heart of a saved person can be the territory of the kingdom of heaven, but only that heart that has received this kingdom of this in the seed of the truth and has grown it into the tree of life that bears fruit of the truth and righteousness. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. John 4, 23, 24. When it's talking about worshiping in spirit, then this, the spirit needs to be purified from dead works. But if a person doesn't understand the difference between good works and evil works, when he goes to evangelize, he runs, he thinks that he needs to do something. In some of our gatherings, there was division. Why don't we have evangelism, they ask. And they left and, and, and took people with them. There's no evangelism here. As if it, it wasn't preached that they need to have fruit to be able, so that the kingdom of heaven, they enter into this kingdom of heaven, not the service of evangelism. For some reason, they all want to do the service of evangelism and think that they will be saved. And so they they use their own personal resources and money for this. God has never worked this way. It was never used. One person did not use his own personal resources. It's the church that invested. And so right now there's companies that are uh, evangelizing, and so you can actually contribute. Um, of course, they do a great evil before God's sight. If God did not send them, and they're going. We, if we go, we go in his name as those who have been sent by him. We deceive people that God has sent us that were missionaries and so forth. They truly believe that missionaries, but they're lawless people whose conscience is not cleansed from dead works. And so the true worshiper that it's talking about is a small flock of the chosen from the multitude of the call to salvation that have received the seed of the kingdom of heaven into their heart upon the condition of God's order that is in the order of the law of the body that identifies theocracy. While a person, by the instructions of faith, will not die for his nation, for his house, and for his uh, genetic desires and considerations, the soil of his heart will not be able not just to grow, but even receive the seed of the kingdom of heaven. It won't even receive it. This will be a hard, typical hard heart stony heart that is not able to receive seed. A person that is constructed in the faith is one who has been sent and placed by God and not people. The one that instructs needs to be a person that is placed by God, not one that is voted for in a democratic matter or in another way. The foolishness of such pseudo-leaders is, in, for the most part, will be revealed to them uh, on the other side where it will be too late for them as the rich man who was buried with a lot of honor uh, and trusted that he was receiving salvation when he with lots of noise went to hell and so however sincere those uh, may be who have followed them in their life they will follow also them in their death remember sincerity is not a reason for God so that one go to hell and you who followed after them but you were sincere and you trusted God 
But this is our choice we need to make. We need to know who we, who, who we trust. Why do you trust people who ha- have been voted for? Why do you trust people who have placed themselves? Why do you not believe God's delegated persons? Why do you use them for your own uh, purposes? Why do you steal from the delegated people of God, God's uh, revelations and, and examples and present them from your own name? Of course, this is very dangerous. And so these so called their so called worship is not a place upon which God has recorded his name. And so these in these churches, this place their place is not a place where the Lord records his name. What do these do who are sincere? God knows how to save his righteous. They will hear the truth and they will uh, there are a lot of relatives there are a lot of people I know. What do I do? Do I come out of this Babylon? Oftentimes people say, what? Do you consider all of them uh, perishing? I say, those who came out resisting the truth it's not us, but the scriptures that say that they're perishing. What, you're the only ones, this is, uh, that we are the only one, and look at this multitude. We need to look at scripture, not at the multitude and what they're doing. We need, to, if they worship not in accordance to scripture, look at what they're preaching. Fruit is just a slogan. Generally, it's all just gifts. Everything is based on gifts. All is based on noise or lots of fame. Of course, we can have a good choir. We can have a great group that will sing. It is important for me and for God. It's important that those who sing serve the Lord and worship God at that time when they sing, let their heart be purified from dead works, that they obey the order of the body, that they hate their jealousy, uh, their jealousy that may arise. All people who are born from God have in them jealousy in their soul. Their spirit is born, but the soul is still there. In their soul, all of these blemishes and characteristics are still there. And now the salvation of the soul happens. And you need to cleanse your heart from this filthy uh, conscience. The conscience is filthy from what we're doing. How do you cleanse it? That means you can not do it. How do you stop doing the evil things when you're a servant of it, when you're bound by it? Many holy people, live, so-called holy people, live two lives. Uh, they're hypocritical. They're, live, they're one way in church. They're different at home. They hide from their husbands, their wives. They do all kinds of perverse things and trust that they'll be saved. Others, the opposite, they just have the right, as they think, to inspect. They uh, present some kind of uh, poems of scripture. I call you, none of you don't uh, put any places of scripture. Uh, places of scripture on the internet. If you if you are to place it, you need to be uh, delegated for this and exp- explain it. But you have your own little opinion, and you want to put some. In, and so, whatever you're trying to uh, say with this place of scripture is not uh, is not in accordance to other places of scripture in the Bible. And so they ask lots of questions, not because they're interested, they don't agree, and they want us to prove. So where were you for the span of 20 years that you are now asking such questions if you're not agreeing? Why is this one not holy? Why is he not holy? Why is he not holy? You can't identify who's holy and who's not holy. I can't, but you can't. You don't have that right to do that. And when you come to me, not as a student, you are just drawing curse upon yourself. Because suddenly, these relative ties, why these are our relatives? They say, well, they're holy. Holy people do not uh, betray the truth. They honor the order of God. This is not just a... A club that you could pass by. If you came here, you became a member of the church and then uh, betrayed the church and left, uh, betrayed the truth. 
No one's going to stand in the way uh, of you leaving, but people will stand in the way of you coming back. Do you think you can repent at any time? If I see that I'm wrong, I will repent. Even if you, if you see that you were wrong and you don't repent. Repentance is a gift from God. If you left incorrectly, God won't give you repentance. If you, due to ignorance, didn't know and did that, God will give you repentance. But if you knew, oh, God will give me repentance later. Before death, I will repent. Before death, it will be too late. Before death, people repent that had not get, been given any other chance. You knew too much. We need to understand that to rejoice at the memory of God's holy name and the mention of his holy name, we need to place we need to look and focus again upon the Zion. There were two more that I had listed, but today we won't be looking at them. I trust that God will give us an opportunity to look at them in the next service. Right now we will bend our knees, however, who is comfortable, our heads, and we will thank God for the word that we were able to hear today. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I worship together with your people upon this blessed place that you have appointed to worship your holy name. This is the place that is... It has your name, and people come to this place and because they come here, you bless this place, and every person coming to this place feels themselves differently. Even if they come here with their demons, demons remain outside of the door and are not able to come in here, these demons. And so your word begins to affect them and Demons may interfere or attempt to interfere, but we thank you that you have made our hearts soft and because we have agreed to die for our nation, for our house, and for our desires, for our soul, for our life. We have agreed to take our cross and to follow after you so that we can be your students, so that we can have the virtue of your student, your servant. We incline our ear every time to hear your word and prepare our heart. <clears throat> Only because of this, your word is being received into our heart. <clears throat> and you can water it, and we thank you that you grow in our heart the fruit of the tree of life. That you are intending to dress our heart and our body into, to have the resurrection of Christ rule within our bodies. We thank you that for this time that we live in, watching the political happenings and the economical things that are happening, watching, seeing these cataclysms, how the planet is shaking as if drunk, and because of the sins that are upon it, you still hold this planet from being destroyed because upon her, your nation is being grown, your children. <clears throat> you are preparing them for eternal life, for eternal ruling, your children, your godly nation. And so the heavens are moving and the angels are attentively watching, the end time is coming, the sunset is coming, the sunset of the, uh, this planet, when it will be cleansed by fire, and will a new heaven and new earth will be created from this very earth, and upon it righteousness shall be, and you will cast out from the depths of the earth hell and cast it into the lake of fire and the new heaven and new earth upon it shall be your righteousness your holy ones will be in their new bodies that are in the likeness of your glorious body we prepare not just our hearts but also our bodies we prepare our heart <clears throat> for the reigning of Jesus Christ we prepare our heart our body so that the law of the spirit of life through Christ Jesus deliver our body from the law of sin and death we thank you for this revelation and we thank you and we 
wait for this revelation. We received it already. It is in us. It's living in us. And so being obedient to your commandments and to your word, to your faith, we call the not existent as existent. We establish and we thank you that you have allowed the resurrection of Christ rule within our body. May your people be blessed now and forever. May your name be blessed in Zion, and may your Zion be lifted up. May it be a joy for all the earth, for all the people that are in slavery, slavery of sin, and may there be a vengeance for those who drink sin as water, who resist the truth. May your holy people be delivered from uh, the unclean and the wicked and may your blessing be upon the sons and daughters now and forever and the sons of curse will inherit curses because their heart will always be casting up mire and dirt we worship before you our great God Son and Holy Spirit Amen our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us finish our service with the unchanging ma manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen.